Welcome. Thank you, Fanny. Great to be here. So, blood, the stuff of life. Who thought I would be enthralled by reading about blood? It's funny, a few people have told me, do I really want to read that book? But uh, most of us can identify with blood. Most of us have at least one spectacular story about our own blood. So I hope that some readers will come to it. Mm -hmm. And how do you explain your lifelong obsession with blood? Well, I've spilled a lot, sometimes in some spectacular childhood accidents. Uh, I had a couple transfusions once when I was very ill, working in um, Niger, a country mm. in West Africa. I inject insulin every day to monitor and control my own blood glucose. So I'm pretty involved with my blood and have been. So that's given me some reasons to meditate on it. And when you were a young boy and you spilled your first blood, you were kind of proud of it. Uh, not when you just fell down, but when you went through the door at the cottage, and you're not a cottagey family, as you point out, in blood, but you go through a glass door at a cottage and you get stitches. It's a bit of a rite of passage or something like that. Well, what's the point of spilling a lot of blood and getting 41 stitches if you can't brag to all your friends about it when you're nine years old? So for sure, if you're going to go through a plate glass window, at least you should live and be able to brag about it later. Mm -hmm. But that particular accident was, was more uh, frightening because I, I was cut very deeply and I was bleeding heavily and I saw all sorts of guts inside me and so I didn't want to see those things and it, it made me sort of aware of the idea that you don't really want to be confronted with all the stuff inside you. That was a, a much more severe accident. Mm. And Niger was no picnic, or Niger was no picnic for you. Uh, you were in hospital watching blood drip into your veins. Yeah, I was um, pretty young, I was 22, and I got to work in West Africa in one of the poorest countries in the world, Niger. It's, most of it is the Sahara Desert. I grew very sick. After a couple of weeks, I think I just drank some bad water, and I you know, just came within a hair's breadth of, of dying, and I needed several blood transfusions to um, be kept from you know, going under. And it was, it was frightening, but it changed me forever. Uh, I watched those blood bags drip into me, and my whole personality shifted. It was a seismic inner shift, and I left that hospital a different man than I was when I went in. Uh, how so? Well. I grew up in a mixed race family, you know, black father, white mother in a white suburb of Toronto. And I, I guess I found myself in Africa as a young man. This is back in 79, hoping that the people of Niger would recognize my African heritage and welcome me as a long lost brother, sort of back to the mother continent. It wasn't planned, it just shot out of me. It was a kind of a molecular need, almost like love, which is unplanned. I just needed to be recognized and welcomed home. But watching myself so close to dying and watching this blood drip into me, was it African blood? Was it European blood? Whose blood was I getting? Uh, that all that really mattered was that it matched my blood type, that it kept me alive, mm -hmm. and that I was able to get out of that bed and walk again. And so I stopped worrying as I got that blood about who I was and how I would be seen. I never worried about it again, and it gave me the confidence to step out more fully into the world and connect with Africa, to write about it, step into the world. I just emerge with a much quieter, uh, gentler, firmer sense of confidence without a need for any outside affirmation as a result of getting that blood and nearly dying. I'm assuming all humans' blood is pretty much the same. Jewish blood, Métis blood, Japanese <laughs> blood, African-American blood, pretty much the same components. Mm, it is, but mind you, if you're a mixed up family like I am, you know, if you inspect the left knee, you might find some black blood, but if you inspect the right knee, you might find some white blood. So you know you've got different colors of blood circulating in your veins. Funny, I'm making fun of that, but people mm -hmm. actually kind of think like that in an abstract way. I can't tell you how many times I've met somebody who said, oh, I've got this friend who's one quarter Korean blood, one quarter Japanese blood, and half mm -hmm. black blood. Like, blood is often quantified arithmetically in the way we talk and think, which is an absurdity. We know a few things for sure. It's red. It is red. Now, it can be darker red in the veins when it's stripped of oxygen, in a, in a brighter red in the arteries when it's just gone through the lungs and it's on its way to do its job in the body. So blood shifts color a little bit in the body, but yeah, it's red. It's red always. You also say, and I believe it's in, in this book, blood, blood fills our imagination just as fully as it fills our veins. 
It does, and that's what interests me the most. I mean, I am curious about all the spectacular and bizarre biological properties of blood, but what interests me the most is how it influences our, how it influences our minds and how it affects our sense of identity, yes, men it, and women, racially, religiously. Mm -hmm. It reveals us, it divides us, it unites us. Uh, male blood, female blood. Think of all the ways that men have completely misunderstood or misinterpreted menstruation. I mean, mm -hmm. men don't understand women at all, and they spent 2,000 years misunderstanding them. Aristotle tried to make sense of this and got it totally wrong. And so um, that's also interesting to ponder, all the different ways that blood makes men and women different. Mm -hmm. And as Gloria Steinem once pointed out, I believe it was Gloria, if, if uh, men had periods, they'd be shouting about it from the hilltops. <laughs> yes, she's got a very funny routine about that. Yeah, I read some of it when I was um, researching the book. And uh, uh, women uh, consider blood, most women. It's about fertility, it's more magical. And for men... Well, men are complete wimps about blood. And now so many women have told me that. Oh, stop whining about that bit of blood. You should see what I had to do last week and the month before that, they'll say. And so I think traditionally, historically, for men, blood is like a trophy of war or sport or maybe somebody shot you and you survived, so you're a hero for having sur survived a, an assault or something. But um, for women, if you're of childbearing age, it's a sign of your health. And you should be bleeding. Unless you're pregnant, you, you want to be bleeding monthly. It's a sign of your health and your fertility. And so men and women, I think, have different relationships with blood because they spill it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I doubt you ever lived in a sorority. <laughs> That's a pretty safe bet. Pretty safe bet. But interesting, and I'm sure it's factual. I know where you're going. Uh, you do. I do. Because women who live together usually uh, menstruate at the same time. Menstruate the same time it's called and menstrual their periods. Synchrony. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that astound you? It did. I read about it. Um, this woman named Martha McClintock, uh, prophet Harvard, wrote about it publicly for the first time in 1971 for this journal called Nature. And she was vilified by male mm -hmm. academics who made complete um, mock mockery of what mm -hmm. she'd written. But uh, most women that I meet, and talk to, including my wife and adult daughters, say that uh, they can't believe I didn't know that before. Yes. And how didn't I figure well, that out earlier? You have an excuse. You're male, <laughs> and you have and you have men's blood coursing through your veins. What about blue blood? Blue blood. Where did well, that come from? Well, actually, I happen to know. Uh, uh, the answer to that is because, of course, blue blood signifies royal or noble blood. But the idea is that if you're of a royal or noble family, you don't have to work in the sun. So your, your skin will be fairly light because you're protected from outdoors work. So if the sun hits your skin at the right angle, your blood might look a little blue under the skin because of the way the light hits it and you're so pale. So blue blood comes from the idea that you haven't had to work in the sun. Your skin isn't tanned or darker. Mm -hmm. So it looks a little differently through the skin. You know, that translucent way that skin can be when light hits it in a certain angle. That's where blue blood comes from. Okay, well, I don't have much blue blood. Neither do I, but we can <laughs> pretend. Of course we can, because who's going to know? Uh, we'll come back with uh, Lawrence Hill, Blood, the Stuff of Life. He's the Massey Lecturer.